Good morning, everyone. Nice to be back here with you. It's traditional in Asian cultures and uh, Buddhist communities before giving a teaching to pay respects to the lineage of teachers and to the Buddha who discovered this practice and the truth at the heart of it. So I'd like to start this morning with a brief ritual of chanting the homage to the Buddha to pay respect to my teachers, uh, the lineage of practitioners who have kept this tradition alive for so many generations and uh, to the Buddha who started this path. Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sangang namasami That melody is from uh, a nun who lives in Canada, Aya Midanandi. And this morning, I'd like to talk about an aspect of the Buddhist path and a central aspect of the practice that can often be ignored or overlooked and in some way uh, explain the significance of the chant that I just offered in a much more long-winded way. It's an aspect of the heart without which we can really get stuck in certain common pitfalls in this practice. I think one of the things that speaks to many in the West about Buddhist meditation is its grounding in a very rational, almost scientific approach. There's a path, there's something concrete that I can do, I can see, time, I can see results over time. And uh, this kind of rational scientific flavor is embodied in a particular word that the Buddha used to describe uh, the teachings and the practice that he discovered. And that word is ehipasiko, which literally means something like come and see or see for yourself. Today in the common vernacular, we might say check it out. And it's that sense of an invitation that you don't have to believe anything. You don't have to sign up for anything. And for uh, many who may have experienced more of a sense of dogmatism or a requirement for blind faith in certain organized religions, this can be refreshing. You know, we don't have to believe or sign up for anything. And there are clear conceptual maps of transformation. And even as that was a factor for me in my own life and devoting so much of my adulthood to this practice, what drew me in, I think what draws many of us in, is something far less tangible. It can be a feeling, a kind of gut knowing, or some sense of inner alignment. I remember very clearly when I heard my first Dharma talk uh, when I was 19 years old in Bodh Gaya, India, and afterwards having this very clear, deeply felt sense of coming home. It was a knowing inside, oh, this is why I was born. This is why I'm here on this planet. And that knowing was so strong in my heart. And yet what was interesting was that I needed to, my rational mind needed to think through all of the steps and the points that the teachers had made in the talk and convince myself rationally to catch up to what my heart already knew. 
And I think this illustrates something very important about the way our heart and mind work, which works, which is that the rational, the purely rational approach leaves something out very important. This is from the um, Buddhist teacher Ayakema, uh, German nun, uh, profound uh, practitioner and teacher. So she said, we have a heart and a mind. The mind is the thinking, logical, analytical part, and the heart is the one that has feeling and emotion. If we don't use both, the logical, analytical part and the feeling part of ourselves, we're missing out. Half of ourselves is not actually engaged. We can't do this with half of a person. Whatever we do, be it meditation or anything else, it has to be done wholeheartedly. When we can't bring our whole heart into our practice, into this path, as I mentioned, there are all kinds of pitfalls along the way. So when we leave the heart out, the practice can get very heady, very analytical. We start intellectualizing everything. We hear all of these teachings about the three characteristics and the four foundations or the five aggregates or the six sense bases or the seven factors of awakening or the eightfold path and so on. And we start trying to figure it all out. We can get stuck in our head. And I think what you may have found is that once you really get in there in the meditation, you notice that life is a lot messier than all of the maps and conceptual ideas seem to be on the surface, right? There's, there's something going on down here in the body. There's something happening here that's not cut and dry. Another common pitfall is taking a more mechanistic approach to the practice where we get this idea, okay, I just have to do this. I just follow the directions and do it, you know, so many minutes, so many hours for so many days, and then meditation becomes another thing on the to-do list. And we can develop uh, this sensibility that life gets reduced to just accomplishing tasks, following schedules, getting things done, and meditation gets subsumed by that approach. And we lose touch with the sense of vitality, uh, the, the awe, the aliveness and freshness of being born. When that happens, the practice can get very dry, very autom automatic. We lose heart and the, it just becomes rote. Another uh, pitfall of not being connected to the heart in our practice is over time we begin to feel a sense of obligation. And we start telling ourselves, I have to meditate. I really should get to the cushion. I haven't done it. What's wrong with me? And I know for myself, I went through a period in my practice where there was so much pressure internally to meditate that something inside of me just rebelled and said, I don't want to do that. So then we end up fighting with ourselves and struggling inside. What's happened is we have externalized our own sincere motivation. We've placed it outside of ourselves in some other authority, whether it's uh, a teacher or the idea of the Buddha or a friend or a therapist. But we lose touch with our own sincere motivation, why we're really doing this or what drew us here in the first place. And what's missing in all of these is a certain quality of heart, a, a whole dimension to this path of liberation, what we could really call the heart of the practice. And this is what I'd like to explore with you today, which is an aspect of this path that often gets left out here in the West and yet is so core to what we're doing. And that's the aspect of devotion. And one disclaimer, before I continue um, to say again, to bring it back to this spirit of Ehi Pasiko. So I want to share from my own practice, my own understanding of what this devotional quality means to me in my own practice and how it's been helpful and how I understand it to function. And I invite you to listen and see what connects with you, what speaks to you. And if it doesn't, then to just leave it aside, to not uh, believe that you have to do anything just because I'm suggesting this is important. 
So the Buddha spoke quite a bit about the importance of having a particular kind of relationship with something that we hold in life as sacred. A relationship of devotion to something we consider worthy of our respect and reverence. And there's a very, what I find to be illuminating story about the first days after the Buddha's enlightenment. So he'd been practicing intensively for six years, really ascetic, rigorous practices, and finally found some balance in his path, sat down beneath this tree along the banks of a river with a firm determination, as we talked about last week, this resolve to awaken to the deepest truth that could be known by human beings. And over the course of the night, he had several profound realizations that completely freed his heart and mind. So afterwards, as the texts recount, he was just kind of sitting in this state of bliss and freedom, dwelling in the fruits of his realization. And one of the things that the texts recount upon his great awakening, hanging out, enjoying the bliss, enjoying the peace under the trees by this river, one of the few things he recounts contemplating was this sense of, okay, now what? I want to read to you what the texts uh, say. So he's contemplating what to do, and he, said, he thinks to himself, it's painful to dwell without a sense of reverence and deference. But what teacher, what monk or Brahmin is there under whom I could dwell in dependence, honoring and respecting them? And then he goes on to contemplate various aspects of his own realization, saying, you know, my concentration is pure, my wisdom is, is complete, my own ethics are complete, my virtue. So he's acknowledging, if there were someone under whom I could honor and dwell, then I would, but there's no one. And then he says, but there is this Dhamma, this truth, this way discovered by me. Let me then honor, respect, and dwell in reverence of this Dhamma to which I have become fully enlightened. I find this so interesting that a fully awakened being, after their enlightenment, would want something to revere, to respect, to live in dependence on. Like, what does that say? To me, it reflects a deep understanding of something about us as human beings, something about what brings us happiness and well-being, that there is some aspect fundamental to the human heart that is a longing for a spiritual connection and a sense of reverence. And for me, I look around today, and I think what many of us are suffering from is a pervasive sense of emptiness brought about by the extreme materialism of our culture. There's a, a spiritual hunger that's due to the absence of anything sacred in our society, the loss of something worthy of reverence and devotion. And it's a great sadness to not have something sacred to be in relationship with. And what do I mean by sacred? I mean a connection to something larger than our sense of self, a sense of perhaps our life having some direction, meaning, or purpose. For some, it occurs as a deeper sense of loving and being loved, again, that takes us out beyond the small, narrow sense of self. And sometimes we don't even know what it is we're missing or wanting, so that feeling of reverence and devotion gets displaced. And in the absence of the sacred, it leaves a kind of void. What are we devoted to when there is nothing worthwhile to revere? And again, if we look back at the, the, the records of the Buddha's teachings from 2,600 years ago, he spoke to this. Actually, in his very first teaching, or what we believe to be one of the first teachings that's been, that was recorded, the Buddha warned 
about the human tendency towards a kind of unexamined habitual devotion. Here's what he said. Friends, there are two extremes which should not be followed by one devoted to this path, by one who has gone forth. What two? Being devoted, bound to sensual happiness in sense pleasures, which is base, vulgar, the way of worldlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and being devoted and bound to self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, unbeneficial, avoiding both of these extremes, I have discovered the middle way which gives rise to vision, knowledge, leads to peace and to awakening. So he's talking about being devoted, bound. The word anuyoga literally means to be yoked, to be bound to, being devoted to, on the one hand, this blind pursuit of sensual pleasure. And I think we see this, right, throughout our culture and society, this incessant seeking of comfort, of pleasant experiences. It shows up in other ways, too, as, you know, what are we devoted to in the modern era? Devoted to efficiency, devoted to time, devoted to money, image, status, our role, all because our sense of self-worth and belonging gets defined through what we do. Or perhaps we get devoted to our screens and seeking some satisfaction or entertainment or pleasure there. So this is one extreme that the Buddha said to avoid. And the other is, in ancient India, it was self-mortification through ascetic practices. Now, obviously, today we don't see people wearing hair shirts or lying on a bed of nails, but the self-mortification has become psychological. It's been internalized where we have this epidemic of self-judgment, self-criticism, doubt, loathing, self-hatred, where we beat ourselves up inside. We don't have a feeling of warmth or tenderness for ourselves. So this is the path not to follow that the Buddha is talking about. So what is meant by this word devotion that I'm using? It's speaking to, it's, I'm pointing to a whole realm of nuance in the heart that's present in the teachings and the path. There's a range of words that refer to this dimension of the heart, all these various shades. And so I want to share with you some of the words and some of their translations and just invite you to notice, like, what are the associations, connotations that come up for you when you hear a word like faith? or devotion, and how some of the other words I'll use to translate touch different nuances for you and see which ones speak to you. So in the chant that I did, the first word is namo. Namo means to honor, to praise. Another word in the text that I'll talk some about is sadha, often translated as faith, but which could, which could be translated and in many contexts refers more to a sense of trust, aspiration, conviction, or confidence. Sometimes it's translated as placing the heart upon. Another word in this domain in the teachings is garawo, which means revere, respect. I already mentioned Anu Yoga, which means uh, to be devoted, to be bound to something, fully committed. And then, and then another word, which I'll get to towards the end of our time, is Atapi, which is a kind of sincerity or ardor, wholeheartedness. So when I'm using these terms devotion, there's this whole range of nuances in the human heart of this particular quality of relationship to something we find worthwhile. So in defining terms, it's also helpful to often talk about what we don't mean. So what's, what, what's not meant within the Buddha's teachings by faith, devotion, reverence. So the first thing is not talking about blind faith or blind devotion 
one of my teachers, uh, Venerable Ajahn Sachito, a British monastic, uses the phrase reasonable devotion or a reasonable act of faith. And he's pointing to a sense of giving our heart to something based on what we know of the teachings and what we have put into practice and understood ourselves. The German monk and translator uh, from the last century, Nyanaponika Terra, uses the phrase reasoned conviction based on one's own understanding. And the process that's described is one of first hearing the teachings, then reflecting on them, considering them, and then putting them into practice. And the sense of devotion, of reverence, of respect and faith, conviction grows over time through each of those phases of hearing them, reflecting on them, taking them in, practicing them, seeing what's true in our own experience. So another thing that we don't mean by devotion is a cult of personality. The Buddha discouraged excessive veneration to him personally. And there's the sense that guru worship can actually get in the way of progress. Now, in some, in some paths, that is a, a core part of it. But in the insight meditation tradition in early Buddhism, guru worship was, was frowned upon. And that sense of reverence uh, can sometimes be abused, as we have seen throughout history, where the power and faith that is placed in a teacher, if their uh, ethics are not sound, if their awakening is not complete, uh, can cause great harm through uh, sexual abuse, abusing power and money and fame. And this can really shake our faith when someone that we have placed faith in lets us down. So the Buddha was very clear don't put your faith in me as a person. There was one, um, one person in the uh, Buddha's lifetime, Wakali, who was obsessed with seeing the Buddha. He really wanted to meet the Buddha and see him with his own eyes. And the Buddha chided him and said, one who sees me sees the Dhamma, sees the truth of my teachings. Truly seeing the Dhamma, one sees me. The Buddha's pointing, saying, don't look at me as a person, look to what I teach, and when you realize the truth of that, you'll see the essence of who I am. So in the Buddhist tradition, we often pay respects to teachers, to monastics. We are paying respect not to the person, but to what they represent, to the robes, to the sense of renunciation, and to the values that they have committed themselves to. At the same time, the Buddha recognized the nuances there and the importance of cultivating respect. And there were instances where people would address him informally as friend, and he would say, you know, you shouldn't call me friend. Uh, and uh, sometimes he would actually say, you know, no, no, let him pay his respects. It's good for this person to feel that sense of respect and devotion. So it's important to have the sense of respect for elders and the wise and yet to not make it into a cult of personality. Finally, what's meant is not worship. This is not idolatry. So in the Buddhist tradition, um, there's a practice of bowing. Bowing before an altar, before a shrine, before a teacher. Uh, for me, growing up Jewish, this was very difficult to adjust to because in um, the Jewish tradition, One's not supposed to bow to any image. The idea is that that which is divine and sacred is beyond anything in the physical realm, and our devotion should only be to that. So it took time for me personally to, to adjust this and to understand the inner meaning behind the outer act of devotion. And what's interesting is in the first few hundred years after the Buddha lived, there were no Buddha statues or images. The Buddha was represented by an absence, uh, a pair of footprints in the ground, or an empty chair. It was only with the influence uh, of the Greeks and their emphasis on statues and having uh, physical representations of their gods that ancient Indian culture started creating statues of the Buddha several hundred years afterwards. And many Buddhist teachers have pointed to 
the essence of what it is to bow and what's meant by a Buddha image, a Buddha statue. Ajahn Buddha Dasa, the famous Thai scholar and meditation master, people would come to his monastery and try to donate a Buddha statue. He didn't have any Buddha statues in his monastery, and he would say, you know, you apparently, I, I hadn't met him, I've heard stories, he would say, you know, if you want to bow to something, see that rock, go bow to that rock. You see that tree? Go bow to that tree. That's the Buddha. This is, um, this is from the Japanese uh, teacher, uh, Dogen, the founder of the Soto Zen sect of Zen. The body and mind of the Buddha way are the grasses and trees, tiles and pebbles. They are wind and rain, water and fire. You should create a Buddha image or stupa from empty space. Create a Buddha image by scooping water from the valley stream. So this sense of what it is we are devoted to is not the image. This is not about worshiping an idol. It's, it's what's, what it represents and what's inside it. And I'll speak about this a little bit more. So the Buddha talked about this, this realm of the heart of devotion in, in many different ways. The first of what are known as the five spiritual faculties, the indriya, is faith, sadha. And the Buddha talked about this as the entryway to the practice and the path. He says one has confidence in the Buddha, in his awakening, and the goodness of his heart. So what is this quality of faith that the Buddha says is, is necessary for the beginning of the path? Well, we, if we look at the word and, and, and understand the deeper meaning of it, it's not necessarily what we usually think of as faith in the West. In the West. It's as connected to a sense of aspiration, possibility, conviction. There's the sense that there is something possible for us in this life that could be more fulfilling. Together with a quality of mystery or wonder, I don't know, let's see. So the indriya, these are innate faculties. These are things that we are born with, like sight and sound and uh, smell or touch. And so these are spiritual faculties. We, the heart is imbued with these capacities when we are born for faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And we can develop them. So this first faculty of sadha, we need to recognize the possibility of freedom, of awakening, of something better, to even be willing to make effort or energy. Right? Without that initial sense of trust or faith or confidence, we won't try. We won't believe there's actually anything worthwhile here. And we, we become imprisoned by the narrow sense of our own ideas. Sharon Salzberg translates the word sadha uh, as faith sometimes, and she defines that as trusting our own deepest experience. And I love that. It really speaks to the felt sense of what this word represents, that there is something that can take us out of the small sense of self that we can rely upon and follow. And this connects us with something greater. There's a, a beautiful story I heard about one of the Western nuns in the Amaravati community, the Western branch of the Ajahn Chah lineage, who recounts a story of coming to the monastery when she was still a lay woman and seeing the meditation hall and the Buddha image and being so moved that she got down on her knees and bowed and put her forehead on the stone floor. And she described in that moment of putting her forehead on the floor this huge sense of relief. Like, I don't need to do this all on my own. There's something larger than myself that I can surrender to, that I can trust, that can hold me in this life. That's what we mean by devotion. It's, it's this. It's this gesture. Bowing the head, raising the hands, that sense of 
letting go and honoring something beyond the small sense of self. The Buddha also spoke of these qualities of devotion as a blessing, as a positive character trait, and as a prerequisite for the development of wisdom. In the Mahamangala Sutta, uh, this recounting of 38 of the highest blessings one can experience as a human being, right at the top of the list in the top three, the Buddha talks about puja, is another word for devotion. Puja means to honor. He talks about honoring those who are worthy of honor is a great blessing in human life. In the same, in the same text, he talks about living with a sense of reverence, a quality of humility is a great blessing. And that same word for reverence, garavo, in another text, in the numerical discourses, the Buddha talks about this as a prerequisite for wisdom. When one meets a teacher, one needs to have a sense of reverence. So what is this? The blessing of honoring those worthy of honor, of living with reverence or having respect for a teacher. The, the, what the heart is bowing to here, what we are revering is the goodness of the human heart and the potential for wisdom, for maturing through spiritual awakening. When we honor those who are wiser than us, we feel uplifted by that sense of reverence, and we attune to the potential for our own goodness. We see in them reflected the possibility, the vision of our own heart released. And it's only when there is this quality of reverence, of devotion, of humbling, of lowering ourselves, that we can receive and learn from others. And so it's a certain attitude in our heart. So these various qualities of devotion, of sadha, of trust, of confidence, of reverence, these are expressed in many different ways. There are many practices to embody and cultivate and strengthen these aspects of the heart. So devotion can be uh, an outer form, an outer practice, but also there is an inner practice. These, there are these two levels of meaning, meaning the outer and the inner. So I'd like to explore this a little bit more, both the, the practical sense of, well, what does this look like? Right? Okay, so I meditate, I sit for 20 or 30 minutes a day. What does it mean to cultivate a sense of devotion? both externally and internally. So on the outer level, expressing devotion, showing respect or reverence, the Buddha talked about traditionally in this path, paying respects to what's known as the triple gem. And this is a kind of an embodiment or summary of the different facets of the Buddhist teachings, the, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So honoring the Buddha, the Namotasa that I did at the beginning, is um, showing respect for the wisdom and the power of his awakening, as well as the potential that he represented, the potential for awareness and awakening that is within each one of us. Honoring the Dhamma, honoring the teachings, and being devoted to the truth, to the deepest truth that we can know. What does it mean to live a life of devotion to awakening, to awareness, to live a life devoted to truth, to really plumbing the depths in any situation of what is real, what we can know? The Sangha is the community of practitioners, those who have awakened, uh, the monastic community who's devoted their lives to this path, and our relationships in our own communities of fellow practitioners. So, Having a reverence for the Sangha means being devoted to the embodiment of goodness, the qualities that those on this path pursue. And so this sense of reverence or devotion for the Triple Gem can be expressed, can be carried out or embodied in many different ways. So chanting, a very powerful way of accessing and expressing devotion. I've already spoken about bowing. This expresses another uh, aspect of devotion, a sense of lowering oneself. And there are 
many ways to bow. You can bow just standing, uh, putting, uh, getting down on one's knees, a very powerful way of bowing, really humbling oneself, getting down on one's knees and placing the forehead on the ground and the, the palms and the forearms on the ground. In the Tibetan tradition and other traditions, in Mahayana Buddhism, they do a full body prostration, laying your whole body on the ground. And the, the meaning of a bow can be different for different people. For me, it's an expression of my sense of deep gratitude to my own teachers, to, to this path and practice, a sense of respect for the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and ultimately for the, the goal, the, the truth that is beyond words, the possibility of awakening. Now, as I said, it took a while for me to get there. This is not something that I said, oh, this is great, but to really feel like this was something that my heart could express authentically. And, and a bow is like a whole body mudra. A mudra is a, is a position of the hand. So if you just put your hands together like this, it's kind of called prayer position, just feel what that feels like in your body placing your hands, palms together over the heart. It's a very powerful position. All of the uh, energy lines and nerves in the hands are kind of in symmetrical contact. It, it, it brings a certain quality of presence. So bowing is kind of a whole body mudra. And what we're talking about with prayer, as I said, is not uh, with devotion, excuse me, with devotion is it's not prayer. We're not praying to someone. It's not an idolatry or worship but it's, it's an offering of the heart. Another way that devotion is expressed in this tradition is, as I said, through puja. Puja is an offering, so you, you create an altar, a sacred space. I'll say a little more about that in a moment. And traditionally, one offers candles, flowers, and incense. So candles represent panya, wisdom, the light of wisdom. Flowers represent the fragrance, the beauty of virtue and ethics. So, uh, incense, the, the point of incense represents samadhi, the stillness and stability of the mind. Uh, pilgrimage, another very powerful universal way of expressing devotion. Going to visit holy or sacred sites in one's life or in a particular tradition. What makes these devotional acts is not that there's something inherent about, say, bowing or, or chanting or you know, putting some flowers or lighting a candle on a, on a shrine. The Buddha was very clear in discouraging his followers from getting too fixated or attached to rites and rituals or systems and structures. Devotion, as I said, is not an act of prayer. We're not venerating something outside of ourselves. And in ancient India, to, to discourage a, a fixation on rites and rituals was radical. The culture of ancient India was steeped in, in ritual purity. And the Buddha said, you know, one is a Brahmin, a holy person, not by birth or ritual, but through our actions, our deeds, and what's in our heart. So what, what makes these acts devotional, whether you're bowing or chanting or putting flowers on a shrine or going on a pilgrimage, and other ways of being devotional that I'll, I'll share is, is the value that we give them. And this is the inner meaning of devotion. It's the intention behind the act that imbues it with significance. There's a movement of the heart that expresses something sincere. And this is about discovering the sacred, what Ajahn Sachito refers to as entering the sacred. It's like we, we open, <laughs> it sounds wild to say this, it's almost like we open a portal in our lives that puts us in touch with a different aspect of, of life that is sacred. How do we do this? Well, what lights up your heart? You know, how do you connect with something larger than yourself? You know, maybe there's a certain feeling when you give to your child 
or your spouse or partner or parent. You do it with your whole heart and it takes you out of yourself. There's something sacred about that moment, perhaps. It could be a connection with your ancestors or lineage. In many cultures, it's uh, common to place flowers on a gravestone or to light a candle on the anniversary of one's death. What's that about? It's about connecting to something beyond our own lifetime. Or uh, right now in the sky, Venus is the brightest it will be in some you know, decade or, or longer. You can see at, uh, at dusk the crescent moon waxing and this bright star of Venus. You should look at the night sky and, and connect with the sense of vastness or mystery of being alive. And this can evoke a sense of awe, this quality of reverence or respect for something larger than ourself. Many people find it useful to, to create some kind of a shrine or altar in their home and place certain objects, a stone, a seashell, a picture, something that reminds us of what's most important. Christina Feldman from Gaia House in England, she, she refers to it as something too important to forget. And when we do this, when we align our heart in this way, we enter the sacred. We connect with something larger than ourselves and move beyond the small thinking mind, the rational reasoning mind. We enter a space where who we are, what we do, is no longer defined by the organizing structures of the mind that's always trying to make sense of the world, get everything lined up. And so the, the act of devotion becomes a symbol. It has relevance beyond the purely physical realm and connects us with the, the aspect of the human heart and mind that is not rational, the realm of, of myth, of, of poetry, of metaphor, the archetypical realm, the vision of the hero or the heroine. And there is great power there in the psyche and in human consciousness, the power of the unconscious, of archetypes, of the the collective. And so we're able to tap into a deeper layer of the psyche and, and a source of trust and orientation and aspiration that doesn't come from having to figure something out. What's powerful and beautiful about these acts of devotion, whether it's lighting a candle or bowing or chanting, or whatever it is for you, is that sometimes they reflect this inner movement of the heart, this sense of opening and trust. But other times, when the heart feels dry or empty, these acts can catalyze that inner experience. They can call forth this attitude of reverence and respect and humility. They can remind us of our deeper intentions and aspirations and align us with the vision of our highest potential in this life. So the inner practice of devotion is not about what we do. It's not in the act. It's about how we do it. And this is the inner meaning of devotion. It's about a quality of wholeheartedness that ability to, to choose fully and give yourself to something rather than needing to think about it. It's what I was longing for when I first heard these teachings. Something inside of me knew and I just wanted to give myself to it. The word devotion has the word vote in it. It means you, you, you choose fully this. The Buddha said the best way to honor him, to show this attitude of devotion and respect, was by practicing, 
was by walking the path. And this is, this is the inner pilgrimage. It's the journey of the heart to awakening that we take on this path. Devotion has also a quality of, of generosity and receptivity to it, right? When you're really devoted to something, you give a lot to it. Like if you're devoted to a particular kind of music, right? you listen to it a lot, you give it your full attention, maybe you read about its history, or if you're devoted to your children, your spouse, your partner, you spend time with them, you take an interest, you listen, you you open up fully to who they are. So to be devoted to this practice, to this path, means that we give a lot. We give a lot of ourself. We give all of ourself, our time, our energy, our listening. This is the quality in the Buddhist path that's known as atapi, ardor, wholeheartedness. In the Satipatthana Sutta, one of the foundational meditation texts in the insight meditation tradition, early Buddhism. There are three qualities the Buddha points to over and over and over again. Sati Sampajanya, Atapi Sati Sampajanya. So Sati is mindfulness. Sampajanya is a quality of wisdom, full awareness and intuitive knowing. This mindfulness and wisdom is only complete when it's together with Atapi, with devotion, wholeheartedness. This means that whatever we do, we do it fully, completely. We give ourselves to it. And then any action, anything we're doing in life, can be imbued with a quality of beauty and significance, meaning and dignity. When we, when we begin to touch into this quality, our practice expands. It's no longer about sitting on a cushion or doing some walking meditation. It's about how we live. And this quality of wholehearted devotion, of really giving ourselves, it starts to reveal the way our tendencies towards control and aversion, our blind devotion to getting the way we want, actually imprisons us. That it robs us of our contentment and joy and fulfillment in life. It limits our capacity to open to the beauty and the mystery of being alive. It makes certain activities not worth our time and other things more important. And what does that mean? That something's not worth my time? Oh, just doing these dishes. Oh, just doing this paperwork. We're missing our life. Is any moment any less sacred and mysterious than another? Not when we're connected to the spirit of reverence and devotion, this aspect of the heart. So I encourage you, I invite you to explore this in your own way. Find what this is for you. Being devoted to this path, to this practice, to awakening means that our North Star, our vision in life, becomes this possibility of a fullness of freedom and a sense of humility and reverence for something beyond ourself. And then all of our life, all of our activities can become our practice. We put our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole being into it. And whatever we do, we can do it fully, completely. And then our life becomes an expression of the truth. It becomes a blessing. So thank you so much for your kind attention this morning. I hope that some of these reflections have been useful to you. Anything that's not, you can just leave aside.